My name is Jean Taylor, and I am currently a director on the education team at Lincoln Center for the Performing Arts in New York City. Just to begin with a very short visual description, um, I'm a white woman with uh, short blonde hair. I'm wearing a um, blue sweater over a little white top, and behind me, uh, I'm in a, uh, an apartment in Brooklyn. I have uh, something there, a little painting on the wall, and I have some, which I will show you, little birds in the air and some plants off to one side. And I am here with my dear friend, Marika. Well, hello, my name is Marika Kret Reitzis. Um, I'm a woman wearing a black shirt. I'm uh, standing in front of a wooden wall in our kitchen here in Montreal, in the province of Quebec in Canada. Um, I work as an arts uh, education consultant, um, uh, working with aesthetic education, um, accompanying uh, presenters, doing research, giving training, and I am very happy to be here with my dear friend, Jean. Um, we're thrilled to be part of the Maxine Green Institute International Conference. Um, why I'm so delighted is that this is one of the most delightful partnerships, collaborations that I've ever experienced in my fairly long life as a teaching artist and um, arts administrator. And we are here today to have a little conversation and share with you um, some of the key aspects of the collaboration and partnership that's been going on for the last five years between Lincoln Center Education and Place des Arts. And at the core of it, is Maxine's work, Maxine's philosophy, and the resonance of aesthetic education um, throughout Quebec. So we're gonna start with a few questions, and then uh, we do plan, after this is being recorded, to be with you um, in mid-January for a live Q&A. Uh, Q so let's start by sharing um, the model that was created by Marika and her team at Place des Arts, um, to not only bring aesthetic education to the work at Place des Arts in Montreal, but also amazingly to spread that incredible work and that out through all of Quebec. Um, it is an effective, smart, and continuing model. So we haven't reached an end point with it. It's ongoing. So Marika, can you share a little bit about the model, maybe where we started and then how you developed it. Sure. Um, so, and just maybe prior to that, while uh, when the partnership took place, I was actually working at Place des Arts within the team. So just so that you all understand why I was part of it from the start. Um, so yes, the this wonderful partnership uh, that was so powerful in the uh, for the whole community, but also, I would say, for myself as an individual um, and for us, um, it took place the first year um, within Place des Arts program for our teaching artists and teachers or educators um, <clears throat> that we brought together uh, with us, the presenter, to um, build on an approach and have them work together, understand their, their different realities and uh, develop a common language around aesthetic education, which was um, the philosophy we were kind of intuitively putting into place without really knowing that that was it. Um, and so that was like the first year. And um, while thinking about our partnership, we and, and the model we were <clears throat> putting into place, we were also thinking about how we could be sharing those learnings and discoveries with our bigger communities in Quebec. Uh, communities meaning teaching artists in practice, <clears throat> intervening in, um, in school settings, but also communities of educators, um, 
and in the whole province of Quebec. So how could we share those uh, learnings and discoveries? Um, and how could we make sure that these learnings could be uh, sustainable within each uh, different milieu? So it was for us at Place des Arts, but if we were um, if we wanted to share them, how could that stick, you know, with all of these um, wonderful people joining us? <clears throat> and so one of the key questions was also, who are the stakeholders or, mm. <laughs> you know, people who, who, who we would need to have with us for this, uh, for this uh, adventure? And so we came up with the idea of uh, uniting teaching artists, educators, and uh, presenters all together within teams uh, that were um, displayed into different regions of Quebec. So we we put in place a model over five years, um, starting with three regional teams uh, that were um, um, taking part of this training camp in aesthetic education for mostly a week or four days. Um, and uh, and each year we had more teams joining us. So the first year was three regional teams. The second year was four, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. And then we moved on to five to six uh, and to five again uh, last summer. Mm -hmm. And um, And so it was very powerful, I think, to have them all together. They were all working on a specific work of art that was part of the presenters uh, programming for the next season. So they came in with resources, um, they came in with materials to work on, and all through the experience of the camp, they they yeah developed a common language around aesthetic education, but also sharing their own realities and getting to know each other so that when they left the camp, they could continue the work around uh around the work of art around their projects Can, yeah so i'm just going to um mm, sure add on for those of us so i'm imagining our um uh, attendees at the conference our um, educators um, arts administrators presenters hopefully and of course teaching artists so what um just to underscore how beautiful this uh model how why it worked so well is that for so many years when I did any kind of um, training or development lab work with um, teaching artists or educators, often they were separate. It would be, oh, here's a teaching arts training, here's something for our educators, and rarely did we anyway at Lincoln Center work directly with presenters. So just to echo what Marika has already shared with you, they came as stakeholders and as a team and they didn't all know each other necessarily that well, but they were coming from the same region with a project. So all of you who have run many different workshops and facilitated things that so as we worked through um, deep engagements with works of art, as we talked about inquiry, we talked about art making, reflection, contextual information, um, these teams were, as Rika said, developing a common language but they also had immediate application. So mm -hmm. there we are in the morning doing this and by the afternoon of every day, they're in their team applying what they had just experienced. So that's why I, I hold it up as a model that many of us can learn from because there, was, there wasn't a gap in two ways. I already have a team. I'm not, a, I'm not like a teaching artist going back to a region thinking, how do I do this now on my own? I already have a team. Uh, and I have a project. So uh, I think, uh, is it 25 regional teams, Marika? Um, I, I think it's 23. I should have looked before. <laughs> it's 23. And so what I want to also add here, and I uh, have um, Marika speak to is, it, there was a forum in this mm -hmm. just in October where members, participants from all five years gathered and talked about aesthetic education, talked about being a teaching artist in their region. So I'll just let Marika talk about the forum because what a brilliant idea now, because what they really now know they're part of a, a bigger community. Mm -hmm. And and that that was uh, what, what you just said is really something that, that felt really strong during the forum. And 
I would say at the end of each edition of the camp, it's like we all feel that we that we're part of something better, bigger than ourselves. And during the forum that took place in October, the idea was to gather everyone to to give them a big portrait of this whole uh, adventure. Um, and, you know, over the years, there was a uh, hundred participants who took place, uh, who took part of the of the adventure. Almost half were there from everywhere in Quebec, and it was really um, mind blowing, I would say, to have them all together to meet because some of them didn't know each other and and to um, invite them to to dive in again into aesthetic education in in our big group and to reflect on you know, the experience they had at the camp, but also what they did with it. Some, for some of them, it was five years ago. For others, it was last summer. So they weren't all at the same place in uh, in in regard to the philosophy and practice. And um, yeah, so to have them reflect on their experience to and, and also on, on the next steps. So what, what does it mean for them uh, to think, when they think about aesthetic education in their practice, in their milieu, within their teams, but also as being part of an active community all through the province. Um, I felt it really kind of, um, I, I'm not sure that's the word, the right word, but kind of um, uh, reanimated, you know, like the flame <laughs> of aesthetic education for all of them to, to feel that they, they, that they are part of something that's, yeah ongoing you know that the, the discoveries continue and they can continue to to inquire and to search and to try things and that's I think also another key element of the model is also that um, aesthetic education is open for everyone to make it their own so depending on their their milieu their their professional hats, the, the the context of intervention that that they're that they're in, um, you know, they they've all experienced it in different ways and have tried things and have developed tools also and and so the forum was also a very beautiful platform to really um, put all of these these ideas together and see where they're at and where they want to go, you know. Yeah. So um, it was beautiful as you can hear, um, people coming together, as Marika said from, oh, they did it five years ago, they did it just, but um, it was about also these next steps and how they can serve as resources for each other going mm -hmm. forward. So mm -hmm. that the community is not, that, that Place des Arts does not become the sole uh, convener, which I think is also, uh, you know, mm -hmm. how things really evolve is, as Marika said, people make it their own. Mm -hmm. And I think what what I loved, one of my favorite moments on the, the last day of the forum was um, saying that, you know, aesthetic education is, uh, is a, a, alive. It's, there's, it's not a, it's not static. And um, it's a, a living process, I think is what we called it, a living process, mm -hmm. and said to them, okay, now you go out there and you do some new and wonderful things. You come back and teach us mm -hmm. what you've done with that. So again, uh, the totality of this model um, mm -hmm. is something that um, I'm so happy that we have a chance to share because I think that it is um, so effective and something that many of you out there may want to think about and um, mm -hmm. how to how to structure, especially when you're thinking about expanding. What's the you know, how do you expand without losing what is most important? And then how does it become this incredibly uh, rich community? Which leads me to that question about, we mm -hmm. want to talk about community a little bit because um, one of my favorite phrases from Maxine is that we are a community in the making. Uh, I think about that right now, Maxine Green. Mm -hmm. Institute. Think about being up at Place des Arts at Link Center. We are we are most always a community in the making, and mm -hmm. I think building community both locally at Place des Arts in Montreal and regionally was something that is close to Marika's heart. So mm -hmm. I'm gonna just pass the community baton to you. <laughs> 
Um, yeah, and it was actually very interesting when kind of analyzing the model of the of the training camp um, to see that there are so many levels of communities taking place uh, during the during the process or um, when having all of them together. So there's the community within their teams, their regional teams. There's the community of the big group of learners or co-learners that we that we are together during this time. There's also the community that they go back to when the camp is over and they they bring back their their practice and reflection. Um, and there is this huge community that we are all part of uh, in the province of Quebec. And bigger than that, there is the whole community of aesthetic education in the world. So all these levels of uh, communities was were, were just very interesting also to to kind of observe and um, and see how they would take form and unfold and grow. And um, uh, I think all of these levels were, are rather, uh, are very important to, to the feeling of community that it brings to each practitioner. Um, and you said something which, with which I, I agree uh, so much is that um, it's alive mm -hmm. and it's living and it's ongoing. So it, you know, it's not something that belongs to one person or one institution. If the community is alive, it's because they're all taking action and being in dialogue, which I find very uh, precious and uh, beautiful. So, um, so yeah, community. And I, I think, well, the forum brought that, <laughs> but yeah, we're all part of something bigger than ourselves. And I think that's also something that AE um uh I don't know what's the word kind of captures or you know or or gives us is this idea that it's yes there's resonance there there's personal resonance but there's also a social and collective right. component to it so it's always like this conversation or dialogue between like the personal and social or the individual and collective and in the community building I I, I well I feel we feel that you know that there's this that there's room for individuality but there's a huge room for collective reflection and co-learning and mm. yeah so beautifully Make, said yes. so beautifully said mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. the personal and the collective and mm -hmm. um we did include maxine uh, and her work her philosophy throughout the training camp and um you know often underscored especially near the end of the week that we had we would be together that um works of art are inexhaustible resources for learning yeah and that they and i know i'm speaking to people who already you know live this but that um the works of art release our imaginations to see more possibilities in the arts in ourselves and then why we all really do it, I think, in, in the world around us. Mm -hmm. So, um, make, um, Marika, what does, how do you say imagining the world as if it could be otherwise in French? Huh. Um, imaginer le monde um, autrement, ou comme s'il pouvait être autrement. So beautiful. <laughs> when I was working with Marika up in Montreal, I felt like I spoke French. But I don't. But I, I, I use my imagination. That's what I did, as if I could speak French. Um, so uh, I think this leads us right to our third question that we talked about before we started recording, which is uh, Maxine's philosophy and how and why is it resonant in Quebec at this time? Um, I think it. Well, I, I was going to say, I think it, it always was. Yes. Um, interestingly, uh, it's not an expression, aesthetic education, that was used in Quebec before. Um, so it's like the, the philosophy is present um, in uh, the practice of teaching artists without necessarily calling it that way before this whole adventure. Um, same thing in schools. 
the program, the 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 yeah, the governmental educational program here doesn't talk about aesthetic education, but the 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 how do you say that the fundamentals <laughs> or the, yeah. the the philosophy of the of this program is still anchored in some key concept that relates to aesthetic education so i think it it resonated before even using this expression or diving into the philosophy um and also another thing is that the the teaching artistry practice because here we we talk about cultural mediation or cultural facilitation is also in a big uh, expansion or has been in a big uh, development for 20 years or so mm -hmm. and same regard in regards to everything that's related to arts education uh, in school settings for the past 20 years so there's like this environment that is um uh that is uh um hmm, that kind of uh was kind of open you know for aesthetic education to to kind of uh it was ripe for it it was it was the, exactly. the, the fertile ground for it exactly thank you <laughs> exactly and so when when the philosophy of aesthetic education uh landed and people dived in it just made total sense with elements that were already there but it gave them tools to yeah. really uh put it in action uh which is something that was kind of uh, lacking i think in school settings whether for educators but also for teaching artists um so for educators there are uh, many um prescriptions from the government that uh that that go into that direction but no not a lot of tools that are given into how mm -hmm. could arts education could be put in place or how could um you know dialogues with works of art be integrated in their teaching and for teaching artists it's something it's a field that was also very developed uh, in in intuitively so having tools was was something that was very much uh, welcome i think um but also so it, it made sense in practice um it still does but i think it it also resonates a little bit just like we mentioned before it resonates also with um a will to to um to really be effective in transforming the way we we teach and we learn and we co-teach and co-learn, I would say, and how the arts can really be um, a vector of transformation in the way we experience the world, I think. And so <laughs> recently I was thinking about how, you know, the idea of inquiry is so much related to arts and also education you know like the two they invite us to um investigate the world or in because i use the word investigation in french investigation um and so i think that those two put together in ae really resonates here in quebec with the reality of quebec which is you know different than in the states for example or elsewhere in the world in regards to our program educational program the way the practice is also uh taking place in their in different spheres of activities but also one uh, important element i think is that the reality of montreal for example is also very different than the reality in gaspe which is up yeah. north yeah. so whether you're in an urban setting or rural setting uh like the challenges are not the same transport the transport of students to works of art are not the same and so the the realities uh, bring also different uh, challenges and needs that that differ from wherever you are or your your standing point you know and um and i think the practice in ae also offers a wide range of how you can apply it or, or yeah. um, you know there are principles that are you know that goes across you know the the um but but in a way um depending on where the participants were are from 
and uh, where they're at also in their practice, they would take it from a different um, starting point, let's say, you know, uh, so that it could resonate with their mm. their, their yeah. reality. And um, it's that idea of responsiveness, right, to yeah. um, the community, the co-learners, and mm. um, that's also where we learn so much from each other, which is why these mm -hmm. gatherings of um, you know, international, an international conference like this gives us a chance to hear in the similarities of where and what is going on around the world mm -hmm. or, uh, in relationship to this work. But it also gives us, you know, where we can be surprised by, oh, gee, I hadn't thought about that way of approaching it. Mm -hmm. Or, oh, I didn't realize that that community might need that. So, mm -hmm. um, teaching artists become uh, creative conduits for mm -hmm. uh, aesthetic education in the community they're in, um, really um, tailoring it, really modifying it, uh, using certain uh, a certain approach that will resonate so deeply, mm -hmm. which is great, right? That it then it's not such a, um, we bring aesthetic education to people and it can be modified for the people we don't bring people to aesthetic education and make the people be modified. Like it's no, not exactly. about modification of the human, it's change of the process, of the inquiry mm -hmm. process, of the whole practice of aesthetic education and let it come in and then the person lives it and wears it in a way that suits them, which totally. what a great relief that is. Totally. Totally. And um and I I what one thing I felt was that for most of them, I would say, um, it kind of felt like a relief uh, yeah. you know, to dive into aesthetic education because it made global sense in their practice, but also in their way of experience of experiencing the world. Um, and it, it's actually fascinating to see what they've done with it. Yeah. They've tried out so many things, some over the five last years, uh, some have just started and already are like, you know, being very excited, <laughs> excited about what they've seen in, in classrooms, for example, or how their colleagues are reacting to the projects they're putting in place. And also for presenters, I think it kind of really shifted the way they uh, approach uh like teaching artistry project or the relationship or conversation they have with schools um so yeah i think the resonance is on you know many many levels personal and professional mm. um, so now what we would like to do is we'd like to get a bus an, an aesthetic education mini bus <laughs> and do a little tour of all of these 23 regional teams mm -hmm. Um, so that we can see for ourselves, you know, but, so maybe we'll get that ready for the next conference. So we can visit Gatsby, mm -hmm. we can go to all these wonderful communities and see, well, what, what's aesthetic education doing here? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So anyway, that'll be a little bit of a grant project, I think. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we are delighted to um, have had a chance to share uh, this, this relationship, this collaboration, this model, thinking about community and thinking about Maxine with you. And we look forward to a, a question and answer time with you in person um, in January. Um, Marika, is there anything else that you'd like to add? Um, I think for now it's good, but there are so many things that we could, you know, expand on <laughs> probably. So, um, <laughs> but it was a pleasure. A great pleasure. and. Um, because uh, I had the great good fortune, as many of you probably hearing this, uh, to have Maxine as a mentor. Um, she was our uh, philosopher in residence at Lincoln Center, but also um, I attended salons in her living room. And not just me, many of us, and became part of the green team near the, near the end of her life uh, when we would have some community dinners together. But I shared with uh, Marika before we started that my memory of Maxine when she would uh, be at all of our Lincoln Center summer forums and give a, an incredibly, the variations on a blue guitar uh, compilation of her lectures, um, which by the way is being translated into French. 
I'm just letting you know that because Marie can <laughs> say that, but it's it's gonna it's in process. It's coming. It's coming. <laughs> um, but um, Maxine would just she'd be in this big hall in Juilliard and um, talking to all of us uh, teaching artists and educators together, and um, she didn't have a hat just like this, but she always wore a hat. And um, no matter what, it, I mean, it was a, a hat. And then she always wore, <laughs> as she gave us the lecture, a little purse on her hand. <laughs> as she is, as she is doing, and once in a while, just a little, a little thing, little pats her nose. So what I loved was she would be speaking about these most amazing things about the poetic imagination, the ethical imagination, the social imagination. She always had her little hat. She always had her little purse on her arm. And I just thought, I don't know, there was something so delightful about that picture, that mm -hmm. wonderful character that she was. And I also so thoroughly enjoyed her sense of humor. So I'm just doing a little bit of, uh, I'm, I'm just acknowledging that um, uh, there's a light, there's both a poignancy and a lightness to our work at the same time. Mm -hmm. So, um, Thank you, Marika. Beautiful as usual, and um, thank you to uh, the Maxine Green Institute for hosting us. Okay. Totally. Okay. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Hey, <laughs> look at all you cool people. Yeah, we've been having a great time today. <laughs> oh, that's so good. I'm up here at Lincoln Center and I was in a meeting with some wonderful people from Taiwan and I was thinking, wait a minute, you got to join this international thing. Um, anyway, thank you uh, so much. And I hope you were able to um, uh, grasp the model that Marika uh, created um, in, up in Montreal at Place des Arts that produced this just so thoughtful, beautiful way of expanding to all of these regional teams so that all these wonderful rural communities were still experiencing AE at its best and that it was really smart to make sure they presenters, teaching artists and educators were together in workshops so that they developed a common language and experience and they went left the building already a team mm. and i had not experienced that before we sometimes do separate tas and educators sometimes together but this was also the presenters so off they go to these other regions already a team and already with a project so the application was immediate so I just share that because the, the model for that is something that I, uh, I think is useful in many ways when you think about who needs to be in the room together from the beginning. So I have a question just to get started because we um, have a little bit of time for questions. I'd love to hear other people's. What makes you think um, that the, the Quebec community um, enabled this, uh, Marie, Marika? Is there something about the community there that, as you said, they were sort of open to it already. Um, was it the Place des Arts um, funding? You know, what, what, what's, what held it together? Because um, Well, funding always helps. That's one thing. <laughs> I mean, the conditions were good uh, for them to come to Montreal for a week. But um, uh, beyond that, um, there is a real momentum and appetite towards what we called cultural mediation or cultural facilitation here. And among presenters, there's a um, kind of a need, I would say. Um, they're really in a state of reflecting on how they do things, you know, for such a long time. It was a very... Um, uh, theoretical approach, you know, like you would go in class, you would talk about the play, the artist, uh, its process, uh, etc. But but students were not uh, put in an active posture of experience. Um, so 
there, there, there was an appetite for a shift towards yeah. the way um, the way the experiences and the proposals from presenters to the yeah. school uh, were offered. Um, so that's one thing. And on the teaching artist uh, side, um, it's been a field here that was developed very intuitively. And mm -hmm. there was a kind of a, a little start of, you know, having a few uh, trainings, not in universities, but uh, in um, mm -hmm. different types of settings. Um, and so in that kind of uh, momentum over the past years, uh, teaching artists were also expressing a need for tools and to also be together. So when, so when, when we put the model in place as a Place des Arts uh, person, I would go to presenters first and they would be the one uh, mm -hmm. reuniting or, or building their teams. And mm -hmm. so they would know who the- who It seems as if you have were. a sort of political environment that's conducive to it too, which is of course a, a barrier in many other countries. Uh, we do have a Ministry of Culture that is very interested in the, mm -hmm. in the impact that uh, teaching artistry has in school, and also the Ministry of Education is also very involved. Uh, they work together, sometimes they would need to, <laughs> to work more together, but mm -hmm. in the case of that model, um, uh, it's true that it was a, a like we, we submitted a project to the mm -hmm. Ministry of Culture and one of the reason we could do it is because we got funding from them over a long period of time. So we started for mm -hmm. a one year um, uh, financial support and then we deposited a second uh, version of it, which was the regional teams mm -hmm. for the four years that followed. Long term, that's great. Any, yes. any questions you have? I mean, Heather does. You're muted, Heather. Oopsie. I'm from Canada, as you know, Marika. Um, just connecting to this question that you posed, Holly, and Marika's answer. Um, I'm wondering about the language of delivery, English and <laughs> French or French only. And I'm thinking in a political sense that that has quite a bit to do with why in Quebec, there seems to be so much more money for arts and culture than there is elsewhere. Like the government perhaps is also attempting to work some language magic here, are they? Um, it's, a, it's an interesting question. <laughs> Um, the, the way we proposed our project was, it was not language based, uh, oriented. So, so I, I don't think that element was, was key to why they, they moved forward with us. Uh, that said, the training camp took place in both languages. Um, and for Quebec participants, it was, uh, obviously important that they could feel comfortable expressing themselves in French and receiving also information in their 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 own language. So the way we worked, uh, Jean and I and the, the rest of the team was that whenever um, the team from Lincoln Center was mm -hmm. uh, talking or, 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 or um, giving a workshop, for example, uh, they would speak in English. Most of the participants would understand English, but we would still translate uh, how did we call it, Jean? Spontaneous translation, I think we, we, I believed we called it. So it wasn't like word to word, but more like the essence of it. And whenever we were speaking French, uh, we would translate uh, kind of whisper in Jean's ear and the other member of the teams in English what the participants would say so that we could kind of keep a flow of the whole experience mm -hmm. and conversation. So I don't know if that answers your, your That's question, right. Heather, yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I think it just uh, complexifies the situation <laughs> and yeah, governments are motivated by all kinds of things, right? Thanks, mm. appreciate it. If there's any other questions, yeah. Um, thank you for a great presentation. We really got a sense of the the richness and the enthusiasm that you were and the, and the the warmth that you had with your with each other and and your compatriots up there. It's, it's over five years. It's really impressive that they came back together and you know wanted to continue to grow it. Um, so, are you going to write this up in any way as a academic? 
there's a well there's there's an article it's in french though it's not translated in english in french uh, um that is more like my my um my how do you say that like mon regard <laughs> or my experience from from this mm -hmm. whole adventure and on the inside there's also uh, an essay that is uh, coming up uh, shortly i believe on this whole experience so maybe yeah. jane you want to talk about it a little bit one of our colleagues um, who has uh, Laurel Toyofuku, who came up with us throughout this whole process, um, kept documenting and interviewing. So she has just put together a, um, uh, a reflection on the whole process, including the most recent forum where people gathered again. And we basically said, you know, go find out new things about aesthetic Mm -hmm. education and then come back and teach us so um, I will certainly be happy to make that available um, it's 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 close it's like in its final draft it'll be ready before the end of the month and I can add to that just briefly that there was a research project conducted uh, over several years of that uh, training camp and um, we didn't have the right at the, the moment to publish the the data but we just got them so there will be uh, academic uh, articles that will be uh, written in the in the coming Good. months or year that Wonderful. we could share. Yeah. Great, and we look forward to your translation, Marika. <laughs> a it's very a long sort of run, but it's coming. <laughs> I know you have to have the baby first. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> baby first. Thank yeah. you all very much. We are at right on time. Wow.